right, welcome everybody to the first episode of the Biologic Podcast. In this episode, I'll be introducing the basics of the biological field of science, but first, I'd like to begin uh, the episode with a little talk about the project as a whole. I wanted to start this podcast with a series of educational episodes covering the fundamentals of biological science. What biology means, how cells organize, how DNA stores information to create living things, that kind of stuff. Once the fundamentals are established, I'll create more specific episodes or mini-series. I'll cover uh, the body systems, like the muscular system and the digestive system, uh, neurons in the brain, uh, animal groups like fish, mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. Uh, because biology is far more than just macroscopic animals, I'll also make episodes about plants and fungus, about bacteria and parasites, about microscopic life, and all sorts of other stuff. You can expect episodes about various fields within the sciences, like ecology, botany, and pathology. To help spread awareness and keep things current, I want to have episodes dedicated to news and discussion within the biological sciences. Uh, I want to cover things like new discoveries, important and interesting studies, updates on endangered species, and, uh, if I can make it work, live interviews with people working in the field. Once the show really gets rolling, I'll begin taking viewer requests for episodes about specific organisms, biological phenomena, or fields of study, and I might even do an AMA episode or two in the future. With the housekeeping out of the way, it's time to ask. Biology is the study of life and living things, so what is life? We're all familiar with life, as we're all living things. We and all living things are the sensory particulates of the universe. Uh, we're chemical superstructures that creep across the planet's crust, eating and consuming one another for sustenance. Life is like a self-perpetuating tide of carbon that has saturated the near entirety of the surface of our world. We're familiar with Earth life because it surrounds us, but we really have a very limited idea about what kind of exotic biochemistry could be possible. We have a sample size of one, the Earth, and as far as we can tell, there's only one known lineage of biochemicals, and it's what we see on the planet around us. We simply don't know what kind of life could exist out there. But because of the incomprehensible size of the universe, we can say with near certainty that alien life is out there, somewhere. It's entirely possible that the genesis of animated self-replicating matter, i.e. what we call life, uh, also known as abiogenesis or biopoesis, only occurs under very specific circumstances. By probability alone, there are numerous Earth-like planets out there in the universe with stable climate and liquid water. Uh, and some of these are bound to have organic molecules, single-celled organisms, or even macroscopic life. Given the sheer vastness of the universe, it's probable there are many billions, or likely trillions, of Earth-like planets scattered across billions of galaxies. Each of them could or currently does host a lineage of biochemistry that, because of sh uh, similar chemical environments, shares properties with Earth life. By shared properties, I mean the GTCA format of genetic information storage analogous processes for photosynthesis or cellular respiration, or uh, similar chemical structures for amino acids and proteins. If an alien world had similar conditions to life on the early Earth, as well as roughly similar quantities of the necessary elemental resources, it's logical to theorize that the emergent biochemistry could be similar in form and function to our own terrestrial biochemistry. It's also possible that animated self-replicating matter could develop in a wide variety of environments with a variety of initiating factors. This possibility leads me to think that the galaxy would be teeming with life, as life could originate and develop in a far greater variety of environments than just those that resembled Earth. If life could be initiated by a variety of factors, it's likely that most emergent biochemistries would not resemble Earth life at all. What could this alien biochemistry be like? Does it store genetic information in nucleotide bases, like Earth life, or uh, does it have an entirely different method of information storage? Does this alien life have cells that metabolize nutrients like us? Does the alien biochemistry even form structures that we could identify as cells in the first place? Until we discover alien life, we won't know the answers to these questions. We won't know which of the two possibilities I've discussed are more likely. We can't even be sure that we'll recognize alien life as life when we, uh, or if, we come across it. So how do the biologists, the scientists, how do they define life? What distinguishes living matter from non-living matter? Throughout centuries of study, people have tried to define the qualities of living matter that distinguish it from non-living matter. While there's debate about the finer points and details, scientists have developed five general qualia for identifying life energy, cellular organization, information, replication, and adaptation. Energy is what organisms must obtain to sustain their internal biochemistry and stay alive. Organisms can be classified based on how they gather energy to sustain their bodies. 
Heterotrophs, for example, are organisms that get energy by eating and digesting the bodies of other organisms. You can think of, uh, for example, like a cow, which eats grass, or a shark, which eats other fish. Autotrophs, on the other hand, uh, get their energy by capturing um, sunlight. Like, uh, so plants are autotrophs. Autotrophs means, you know, auto by yourself or upon your own effort. Uh, and so autotrophic organisms are organisms that contain all the necessary biological ingredients uh, to produce energy. All they need is some kind of uh, input, like sunlight. Uh, other organisms, like chemotrophic bacteria that live on the ocean floor, get their energy through uh, various chemical processes, like the oxidation of inorganic chemicals like ammonia or hydrogen sulfide. Uh, this energy is used to maintain their internal homeostasis and to power the various processes within the cells that the organism needs to stay alive. This takes us to the second quality of life, uh, which are cells. As we all know, cells are the fundamental building block of life. The cell is the smallest self-replicating unit within an organism, and it composes or produces virtually every tissue in the body. Cells provide specialized functions to the organism and allow it to sense its environment and respond to stimuli. You can think like uh, an epithelial cell in your intestine that absorbs food, or a cone cell in your eye that allows you to perceive color or a nerve cell which activates your muscle or tells your skin that you're near something hot or cold. The cell theory, developed in the first half of the 19th century, formalizes the role of cells in living organisms. I'll get into more detail about the cell theory shortly, as it's uh, one of two very important theories within the field of biology. Uh, the third quality of life is information. Information exists in the form of a biochemical codex used to build and maintain the organism's body. Earth life uses a genetic code built into molecules of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. The information within DNA is transcribed and translated into proteins, and these proteins literally build and maintain the tissues that compose the organism's body. Without this organizing information, there could be no real organization or uh, chemical coordination, uh, or chemical coordination, rather. This differentiates lumps of wet carbon compounds from chemically organized, self-replicating life forms. Replication, uh, is the fourth quality of life, exists on both a cellular, individual, and population level, and it's necessary for life to perpetuate itself. As an organism grows, its body ages and wears out, eventually succumbing to cancers or cellular senescence or whatever it is that causes us to age. By reproducing, the organism generates new individuals who can live beyond their parents and produce offspring of their own. By reproducing, an organism can multiply and spread its genes out across geographic space and perpetuate its genes through time. Because of replication, you represent the tip of a branch on the tree of life, which reaches back to the very first self-replicating cell. That first cell is the common ancestor of all life on Earth. Adaptation, the last quality, is the ability of a population of organisms to change over time in response to various selection pressures in their environment. This change happens over very long periods of time, as the phenotypes that can operate best in a given environment are maintained, while the phenotypes that operate poorly or inefficiently uh, die off. In this way, the totality of the population becomes more and more adapted to their environment. This is uh, the second fundamental theory within the field of biology. Uh, and you've most likely heard of this. It's the theory of evolution. So there we have it. These are the five qualities that can help define life. The use of energy cellular organization, heritable information, replication, and adaptation are together the defining characteristics of living matter. So now that's covered, I should address the two fundamental theories that I mentioned. Cell theory describes the properties and functions of cells and how they cooperate to form tissues and entire organisms. The theory of evolution describes the processes by which speciation occurs, that is, how a species evolves through time, and how new species can emerge by branching off from the ancestor species. Together, these theories provide the bedrock of data upon which the biological science has, uh, has flourished. Cell theory was developed in the 19th century by two German scientists, a physiologist named Theodor Schwann and a botanist named Matthias Schleiden. Schwann studied uh, nerve and muscle tissues under the, under the microscope, where he discovered the neural cell that would be named after him as well as the digestive enzyme pepsin. Schleiden studied plant tissue and the role of the nucleus in cell division. He published the book Contributions to Phytogenesis in 1838, where he explained, cell, uh, he explained that cells originate from other cells, and how these cells compose every part of a plant and direct its growth. In that same year, 
Both scientists authored and published the microscopial researches into the accordance in the structure and growth of animals and plants, which formalized the knowledge of the time into the first cell theory. The early cell theory put forward three primary tenets, that all organisms are composed of one or more cells, that the cell is the basic unit of organization and structure, and that all cells arise from pre-existing cells. Over time, the theory was developed as better microscope sampling and imaging technology became available. Schwann and Schleiden originally described the interior of a cell as a jelly-like protoplasm, which is now understood to be the cytoplasm. In 1877, the botanist Wilhelm Pfeffer put forward the membrane theory, suggesting that the exterior physiology of the cell is characterized by a semi-permeable membrane. The details and specific functions of a membrane would be contested for decades, eventually developing into the modern understanding of the cell uh, and the cell membrane as a fluid lipid bilayer studded with proteins. In 1935, Carl Lohmann discovered ATP, a very important compound that provides a bioavailable energy source for cells. This discovery really opened the door for what was considered possible, introducing ideas like dynamic equilibrium, membrane potentials, and ATP-powered ion pumps. The modern cell theory has several new tenets added to the original three. These are uh, the total activity of all cells influence the activity of the organism. Energy flow occurs within and between cells. Cells contain DNA in the chromosomes and RNA in the cytoplasm and nucleus and all cells share a similar chemical composition. It is understood that there are two fundamental types of cells. The first type are called prokaryotes, which encompasses the, do uh, the domains bacteria and archaea. Prokaryotes are small cells with uh, circular loops of DNA called plasmids. They don't have a nucleus or a membrane-bound organelle uh, besides ribosomes. Um, the second type of cells are called eukaryotes, which comprise a single domain sharing the same name. You, me, and virtually every living thing you can see with your naked eye is a eukaryote. We are characterized by having larger cells that have organized chromosomes within a nucleus outlined by a nuclear membrane, as well as membrane-bound organelles. The theory of evolution was developed and formalized in the mid-19th century by the English naturalist Charles Darwin. Darwin was born to a wealthy family, getting his education at the University of Edinburgh Medical School and uh, Christ College, Cambridge, where he developed an intense fascination with beetle collecting. Shortly after graduating, Darwin came upon the chance to join the crew of the HMS Beagle. The ship left port on the 27th of December, 1831, heading first to the volcanic islands of Cape Verde, then to the eastern coast of Brazil. The Beagle traveled south, around the Cape of South America, coming north to the Galapagos Islands. It was here that Darwin made the famous observations that would inspire him to formulate the theory of evolution. He noticed that more offspring were born than could survive, given the available resources, initiating a competition for survival. Darwin noticed how, uh, how subgroups of a particular genus would show slight variations correlating to the island they came from. Finches, for example, had beaks of varying size and strength, each seemingly adapted to the available nuts and seeds on their home island. During the voyages, Darwin kept meticulous notes. He was really intent on recording everything he could, on taking meticulous notes and drawings of dozens of sampled species. In addition to the field work, he wrote numerous letters to friends, family, and academic peers about his findings, which were mailed uh, back home at the various ports that they stopped in. Darwin's research was electrifying in the scientific, uh, in the scientific community. Uh, it gave him kind of a quasi-celebrity status, almost. When he got back from his journeys, he was met with, you know, applause and adulation. After compiling the data collected across nearly 30 years of work, Darwin published his famous book, On the Origin of Species, on the 22nd of November, 1859. Since, uh, since Darwin's time, the theory of evolution has been greatly refined, especially in the last 60 years, thanks to the development of modern technology that allows for uh, genealogical sampling. The theory of evolution by natural selection rests on three primary tenets. Traits vary among individual members of a population in what is known as phenotypic variation. The differences in traits influence the rates of survival and reproduction. An organism with traits that help it survive will be said to have a higher fitness. These traits are heritable and can be passed on to future generations. Evolution is the gradual change in the ratio of particular traits in a population. Here's a couple examples of this process in action. Consider a population of mice living in a brush-filled field. These mice have white or brown fur depending on a particular gene. 
Mice with brown fur are better able to hide or camouflage themselves in the brushy field. As a result, the mice with white fur will get seen and eaten by predators more often than, uh, than mice with brown fur. This predation acts as the selection pressure against white fur, as having white fur lowers the individual's fitness. Because the brown fur mice are more likely to survive and reproduce than the white fur mice, the next generation of mice will have a higher proportion of brown fur than white fur. If this trend continues, the traits will go to fixation. The gene for white fur will die out, while the gene for brown fur will be present in 100% of the individuals in the current generation. The mice population has thus evolved purely brown fur. For the next example, consider a population of lizards that live in a jungle. These lizards live in a lowland era, uh, area characterized by an insect-filled swamp in the west and rich fruits in the east. The, liz the lizard population eats from both food sources, until one day a river erodes its banks and spills into the lowland. The river splits the habitat in half, and the lizard population is bisected into two groups, one on the west side of the new river and the other on the east side. The lizards on the west side of the river can now only get food from the swamps. They must hunt insects while traversing a wet, boggy environment. The lizards on the east side of the river can now only get food from the fruit-bearing trees. They must be able to climb trees and avoid predators sharing the canopy. The first group is experiencing a selection pressure for good hunting skills and carnivorous teeth, while the second group is experiencing a selection pressure for climbing skills and camouflage. If these two groups are kept isolated long enough, their respective selection pressures will create and widen a genetic gap between them. Eventually, the two groups will be so genetically different that they, that they, uh, they can't interbreed to produce fertile offspring anymore. In effect, the river altered the environment of the original lizard population, causing it to split and diverge into two new species. While making observations in the Galapagos Islands, Darwin noticed that finches had different sizes and shapes of beak depending on the island they came from. He noted that the beak traits seemed related to the available food sources on their home islands. Finches with small beaks, such as the Geospiza parvula, lived on an island rich in small, soft seeds. A small beak could easily eat the seeds, which made the large beak disadvantageous. A large beak took more resources to grow and would impair the handling of the small seeds. Other fe uh, finches, such as the Geospiza magnirostris and the Geospiza fortress, lived on islands where the only available seeds were big or encased in a hard shell. These finches evolved large, powerful beaks to break open the shell and get to the food inside. The individuals on these islands with small, weak beaks were unable to crack open enough seeds to feed themselves, starving and dying as they were outcompeted by those individuals with stronger beaks. The study of biogeography observes the geographical distribution of various species and compares the genetic relatedness of species with their geographic proximity. In the case of the Galapagos Islands, all the various finches were closely related to one another, and a little less closely related to the finches on the South American mainland. In a phenomenon called adaptive radiation, a species colonizes a new area and begins to diversify to fill the available niches in the area, just like the lizards in my second example. Just as those two hypothetical lizard species were more closely related to one another than they are to the lizards in the valley a few miles away, the Galapagos finches are more closely related to one another than they are to the mainland finches. As species diversify and adapt to their ecological niches, they begin to undergo speciation. Over millions or maybe billions of years, this adaptation and speciation has produced uh, a tremendous variety of living things, all related to one another through common ancestors. The common ancestor of humans, chimpanzees, and bonobos, for example, existed about 6 to 7 million years ago. At that time, the common ancestor population split. Some stayed in the trees, while others descended onto the, gra uh, onto the grassland plains of East Africa. The population that descended onto the plains would evolve new traits to adapt to their new environment, such as bipedalism, a double-curved vertebral column, and an upright posture, eventually becoming the human species of the genus Homo. The population that remained in the trees, known as the genus Pan, would eventually diverge into the chimpanzees and bonobos as recently as eight or 900,000 years ago. If we compile the common ancestors of all species, we can produce the Tree of Life, an elegant top-down map of the phylogenetic relationships between all living things. If the tips of the highest branches represent all currently living species, then the point where two branches join together represents a common ancestor. By following the branches going backwards towards the trunk, 
you can visually explore the relationships between species going back to the very first self-replicating cell, represented by the trunk of the tree of life itself, which appeared on this planet around 3.5 billion years ago. Taxonomy is the study of this tree of life, or more technically, the study of the naming and classification of species as they relate to one another. Classification of species has existed in an, in, uh, in an intellectual format for thousands of years, going as far back as Plato, more than 400 years BCE, but was formatted for the modern age by a man named Carl Linnaeus in the 18th century. With the development of modern technology, fields like phylogenetics and systematics have greatly improved and refined the taxonomic understanding of life. First, uh, a bit of vocab. The titular unit of taxonomy is the taxon, which refers to any named group of organisms like mammals or crustaceans or bacteria. A clade refers to a common ancestor and all of its lineal descendants. There are thousands of clades, but I'll get to that in a minute. Fortunately, there are just eight tiers in the total hierarchical classification of life, with domains being the largest group at the top and uh, species being the smallest group at the bottom. From most inclusive to most specific, the taxonomic classification goes as follows. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. There's, uh, there's only three domains, and these domains are bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota. Uh, bacteria and archaea are both protists, or uh, not protists, but uh, prokaryotes, as I explained earlier, and eukaryota are eukaryotes. There's six kingdoms, uh, Animalia, Plantea, Fungi, Protista, Archaea, and Bacteria. Uh, the kingdoms Protista, Archaea, and Bacteria have one phylum in each of them with the same name. Uh, but the kingdoms Animalia, Plantea, and Fungi each have multiple phylums. Uh, Animalia, for example, has 35 phylums. Plantea has 12 phylums. And uh, the kingdom Fungi has seven phylums. Humans, for example, belong to the kingdom Animalia, the phylum Chordata, the class Mammal, the order Primate, the family Hominidea, the genus Homo, and the, sh and the species Sapiens. We share the family Hominidea with orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and bonobos, but every other member of our genus, Homo, is extinct. Those once living relatives included the Homo habilis and the Homo neanderthalensis, the latter of which became extinct around 40,000 years ago. Consider the wasp, a group of more than 100,000 catalog species belonging to the class Insecta, the order Hymenoptera, and the suborder Apocrita, which they share with the bee and ant clades. Wasps are not themselves a clade. They're instead defined as every species in Apocrita that is not a bee or an ant. If you're a plant person, consider the California sequoia redwood tree, a particularly large and impressive descendant of the first algal mats in the kingdom Plantea. The sequoia is one of three genera of redwood that exist within the family Sequoiaoidea of the family Suppressaceae, the order Penalas, and uh, the class Penopsida, the only class in the phylum Pinophyta. If you're having trouble following because of the strange names, don't be frustrated. These names are just as hard to, for you to remember as they are for me to pronounce. Um, these were particularly specific examples that I hope demonstrated the volume of data that taxonomists have to work with. To get an idea of how complex and detailed the process of classifying species really is, consider this. Any group of two or more species, like humans and our closest cousins, the chimps and bonobos of the pan genus, as well as our common ancestor, any group like this is a taxa. It can be named and used as a level of organization. The taxa that I just mentioned, with humans and chimps and bonobos and our common ancestor, all belong to a tribe called Hominini. But what about the next closest cousin, the gorilla? So the gorilla is in the tribe Gorolini, and together with Hominini, compose the subfamily Homininea. I'm not making this up, these are the real names. Add the next closest cousin, the orangutan, of the genus Pongo in the subfamily Ponganea, uh, and we get a, a family called Hominidea. So Ponganea and Hominidea are both in a family called Hominidea. It doesn't stop there. The family Hominidea shares the superfamily Hominoidea. You may know the Hominoidea as apes. So all those layers, and we've only gotten as far back as apes. The next major tier is the order primates, but it isn't that easy. Hominin uh, Hominoidea, the apes, 
are, in the parv order, Caterini, defined as Old World primates with downward-facing nostrils. Caterini is in the infra-order Simiaforms, the higher primates, itself in the suborder Haplorhini, characterized as dry-nosed anthropoids. Now we're in the order primates. Primates are in a mere order called Primatomorpha, which they share with another order called Derma, uh, Dermoptera. Dermoptera is composed of just two living species, called Kalugo, which are a small creature that jumps and glides with flaps of skin between its legs. The last common ancestor between Dermoptera and primates is thought to have existed in the Cretaceous period, nearly 80 million years ago. So far in the Tree of Life, we're not even past our tree-dwelling cousins, and I'm taking this all the way back to the first reproducing cell, so buckle up. The Primatomorphia belong to a grand order called Euarchonta, and a superorder called Euarchonta gliris, and a magnorder called Boreoeutheria. The word Boreoeutheria has three components in the native Greek language, meaning north, good, and beast. These good northern beasts are placental mammals with external testicles, and they share a common ancestor that existed 80 to 100 million years ago. Boreoeutheria are a sister group to Xenarthra, the armadillos and sloths. This group belongs to a clade with a very difficult to pronounce name. I'm going to give it a try. Exaphroplacentalia. This clade is a sister group to the Afrotheria lineage, which is a clade of mammals that originated from and live in Africa, including elephants and aardvarks. Together, Afrotheria and Boreoeutheria uh, share the clade Eutheria in the subclass Theria. Theria are a clade of mammals that give birth to live young without the use of eggs. The only mammals not in the Theria clade are monotremes, egg-laying creatures like the platypus and echidna. Before we get to the class mam uh, Mammalia, we have to include the infralegion Tribosphenida, the sublegion Zetheria, the legion Cladotheria, then Trechnotheria, then Holotheria. Now we're at mammals. Think about all of the layers of classification I just covered, each one including one more lineage that branched off in one more step back through time. There are over 5,400 species of mammals besides humans and our chimp and bonobo cousins. Each one of them has just as complex a genetic history, reaching back 220 million years to the common ancestor of all mammals. This common ancestor is the Theropsida proto-mammals, or mammaliaforms, that branched off the group Sphenodocodontia, the parent group of all modern reptiles, birds, and mammals. Further still along the tree of life, there is the phylum Chordata, animals with a notochord. Uh, chordata includes all fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, as well as two subphyla of aquatic tube-like animals called cephalochordata and tunicata. This whole mess is all clad within the kingdom Animalia. The common ancestor for the kingdom Animalia came about 542 million years ago during the Cambrian explosion. The closest kingdom related to Animalia is fungi, which appeared as far back as a billion years ago. 200 million years before that came the first algal slimes, capable of living out of the water. Before this, there was nearly 4 billion years of evolution on the scale of single-celled organisms, themselves the first life forms. Organic molecules heated in a primordial swamp in an ashy sky, split by lightning, would eventually coalesce and become the first cells, the first ancestors of all life on Earth. Biology is the study of that life, of all the descendants of those first cells that squirmed through the ancient oceans of Earth's past. That's it for the first episode of the Biologic Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something neat. In episode two, I'll introduce the basics of biochemistry and we'll explore life on the smallest scale. The Biologic Podcast is kept alive by the support of listeners like you. If you want to help support the podcast, please consider buying some merchandise in our official store or becoming a patron by visiting our Patreon page. The official Biologic store can be found at redbubble.com slash people slash biologic slash shop. In the store, you can buy merchandise like t-shirts and coffee mugs and hoodies. All the products have biology-themed art that I designed myself, so I might be biased when I say they're really cool. The official Biologic Patreon can be found at patreon.com slash biologicpodcast. The support of Patreon patrons is very important for the show. Longtime patrons are rewarded with exclusive episodes on fascinating topics and will have their questions prioritized in AMA episodes. Thanks for your support, and as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>